Welcome to the book club. I'm Michael Knowles, and this month we will be reading The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri, Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso. My absolute favorite, not just poem, not just book, my favorite work of art. But first, before we get into that, in our fast-paced world, it is tough to make reading a priority. At least it used to be. But at thinker.org, they summarize the key ideas from new and noteworthy nonfiction, giving you access to an entire library of great books in bite-sized form. You can read or listen to hundreds of titles in a matter of minutes, from old classics like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People to recent bestsellers like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. If you want to challenge your perceptions, if you want to expand your horizons, if you want to sound smart at cocktail parties, most important at all, Go to thinker.org, that is T-H-I-N-K-R, no E, no time for that, .org, to start a free trial and put your mind in motion. It is very fitting, I think, that as we go through my absolute favorite work of art ever composed, we will do that with one of my dearest friends, the Dante scholar, Catherine Illingworth. Catherine, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. Thrilled to be here. So we've only got a little bit to go through today. We've only got about, <laughs> what is it, 1,500 pages or so. Yes, 14,000 lines of poetry. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. In this brief period that we have, just before we begin, tell us a little bit about what actually happens in not just Dante's Inferno, but the whole poem, Inferno, and then Purgatory, and then Paradise. Well, it is a thick stack of books here, but the plot is pretty straightforward. We have a guy who has lost everything. He is down and about. He is in the middle of a dark forest. And then a guide shows up and says, I'm going to save you by leading you through hell, purgatory, and heaven. And he's journeying to God the whole way. It is probably worth pointing out, too. I think some people might, they hear like Dante's Inferno. And you might not realize that the word in inferno in Italian means hell. It's not like right. just an oven or like a pizza place or something. <laughs> this is the story of this pilgrim. He finds himself in, in a midlife crisis, right, in the middle exactly. of his life. Mm -hmm. And he then he goes down into hell. And he's got this poet guiding him. That's right, Virgil. Virgil. The author of the Aeneid. Okay. Yes. And he And he's guiding him because... There's this woman that Dante loves. It's like the love of Dante's life who inspires all his poetry. And her name is Beatrice, which right. means blessed. And she's up in heaven. Yes. And she sends Virgil, who's in hell, on this mission. Yes. So, But Virgil's in hell. So why is Virgil leading Dante all the way up to heaven? Because Virgil was Dante's favorite poet. Okay. He calls him his master and his author. And Dante credits Virgil with the development of his own skill as a poet. He, he loved the Aeneid and Virgil's other works so much that it led him to the career he pursued as a poet. And this brings up another point. The poem includes politics, obviously poetry, obviously lots of philosophy. So what is it? Is Dante, a, is he a pilgrim? You know, someone actually going on this journey mm -hmm. to God? Is he a poet? Is he a politician? Is he a philosopher? Is he, who is the historical person, Dante Alighieri? That's a great question. And the answer is all of the above. Mm -hmm. So he pursued a career as a poet, as a young man, and was very skilled and met with success that way. And then tried his hand at politics, and I had some success there as well. He did, for a little bit. For a little it was, bit. Then until, it didn't go so well. Until his people lost favor, which led to his ultimate exile from the city of Florence, which was the great tragedy that set off this chain of events in his life that led to his ability to write about a man who has nothing left to lose, who has to completely rebuild his life. So this poem, which Dante wrote over decades of his life while he was wandering around Italy trying to find a new home, this is all of his reading. We benefit from everything he read and studied and explored while he was in that period of exile, which lasted till the end of his life. He never made it back into Florence. You know, the, the first time I read this poem was a dozen years ago, so I hadn't really read it properly until we started, started going back through this. And I read it on the course that Dante took when he got exiled from Florence. Great tragedy of his life, and we kind of went all around and ended up in the city of Ravenna, which is where he died. And I think it is, it's worth reminding people, it's written in Italian. So you got to pick a translation. We're yes. using the uh, Durling Martinez translation, which is very good. Yes. But just to give you a sense of the poem, mm -hmm. this used to be my trick at, at parties when I would try to impress girls. To give you a sense of the poem, it's written in in what's called terza rima, right? So it's right. these 
three lines, three, a very important number. It's the trinity, right? There are three parts to the poem. The rhyme scheme, just, just to give you a sense of the Italian, is Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la dritta vera smarita, hai quanto a dir qual era cosa dura, esta selva selvaggia aspre forte, che nel pensiero rinnova la paura, tante amare che poca più morte, right? It's on and on, and it's, the, thank you very beautiful, much. Thank you. That's, 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 beautiful that's, recitation. I've, I've exhausted all my Italian. <laughs> But it goes like, I mean, I, I read that to illustrate. It goes like this in this beautiful three-part rhyme scheme mm -hmm. for the whole poem. Right. Just, just that fact alone makes this thing stunning. Absolutely. What I want you to tell me about a little bit is how the poem combines so many different aspects of the intellectual journey to God, sure, that he's been able to assemble so much into one poem. It's remarkable that he's able to, his, his talent as an artist is so formidable that he's able to draw in all of these other disciplines. He's talking about politics and history and folk tradition in his own area. He talks about family heritage and philosophy, theology, the church history, all of these, pretty much all matters that the intellect can comprehend. He is able to put into this stunning poetic verse, which is why I'd have to agree with you that it's it's the highest work of art that I believe has ever been created. You know, one thing he, he references in here is uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, right. who put together the, the sum of all theological knowledge, right? the yes. Summa Theologiae. And to me, it seems like Dante's poem here is the sum of all art, I don't know, the sum of all, all artistic knowledge has got all of these elements to it. Right, and he's not shy about telling you that that's exactly what he's trying to yeah. do. He is trying to write the best poem that's going to talk about absolutely everything, so that if you've read his poem, you will never need to read anything else. But I have to tell you, the thing that intimidated me about the poem 10 years ago, 12 years ago when I read it, mm -hmm. and continues to intimidate me about this poem, is I just think, I don't know enough to read this poem. Oh, and, I, and I read Italian, right? So at least I got right. a little leg up, but I, I still don't. What would you say to a modern reader who is just sort of saying, okay, I'm going to start with a hundred page novel first, yes. then we'll move on. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just seems overwhelming. Certainly. It? Yes. And the, the person is rare to begin with who wants to sit down with a 14,000 line poem on a Saturday <laughs> night to think I'm going to read some very dense medieval poetry. Yeah. Um, but this is one do they say that when skating over thin ice, your safety is in your speed. Mm. It just keep going. Just keep going. Keep going and find friends. There are no trophies to be won by sitting there trying to power through this thing by yourself. Get a version with fantastic notes that'll walk you through some of the context without getting too mired in the details. And find a friend. My brother-in-law found a, a friend of his and they meet in... They live in New York, get together once a week, and go through one canto at a time. And it's taking them years, and they're sticking with it. But this needs to be read either with other sources of scholars who can help you out with the incomprehensible parts, or with friends who can sit there and admit that your questions are valid. Okay. There are no trophies to be won by trying to do this super duper fast, or do right. it alone, or do it just two people. Right. But there will be a trophy that I will give you at the end, if we can get through a substantial <laughs> part of the poem. So let's begin with hell. Okay. What does Dante have to tell us about l'inferno? What does he have to tell us about the nature of hell? Well, this is what Dante is most famous for, of course. If anybody has heard of Dante, they've heard of Dante's Inferno. Yeah. And so you'd imagine it's some kind of, that he's taking delight in talking about the suffering of these souls, that they're being tormented and tortured and in all manner of these sadistic ideas he has. But really, this is Dante exploring desire gone very, very wrong. He's famous for talking about lust. He talks about the greed for power, for gluttony, for these things that we want as human beings that are not going to take us to very good places. Well, especially on this point of lust, you know, love is kind of mm. the, the central theme of... Right. There, there are other central themes, but you know, love is what, what guides you all the way to the very end of the poem. Right. And in one of the most famous parts of Inferno, mm -hmm. It's the story of Paolo and Francesca, these adulterous lovers yes. who are whipped forever on the wind. Mm -hmm. What went wrong with their desire? Well, Francesca da Rimini is a historical figure who we don't know if she actually cheated on her husband in real life, but she is she's caught in the act, and then she and her lover, or she, her husband kills both of them on the spot, and then they're both sent to hell. But there are shades where, of course, love for others is the, is the ultimate good, so what's wrong with this one? Um, 
Francesca gives an eloquent, wonderful speech where she talks about how she has been so wronged. And this is all, she is the victim. She's, the, she's oppressed by a system that forced her into a marriage she didn't want to be in. That she's, she's, she doesn't see any of her own culpability. Right. So that, the lo- even the way she describes it, the love took her. The love yes, grabbed her Yes, away. she was swept up. She's this yeah. passive figure who has no responsibility for what she's done. Yeah. And she certainly doesn't exhibit any remorse. And so she's kind of stuck together with this guy, Paolo, that she had this affair with. And they're whirling around in this whirlwind for all of eternity. But it's important to note also that Dante places that at the very top of hell, which are the sins that matter much, much less to Hmm. him. There are far graver things of which one can be guilty that Dante is going to really drive home punishments for those people. This is a point that I think is important because when people think of the traditional Christian understanding of hell and heaven Mm. and punishment... We we stick on the fleshy sins, you know. Certainly. We stick on yes. sex, yes. especially. We talk <laughs> right. about sex. Uh-huh. And for Francesca, she says, very interesting. Just the beautiful, the beauty of the language again mm-hmm. here is, she says that love led her away on this. And then mm-hmm. the f- this famous line in the Italian is, "Amor conduce noi ad una morte." Love led us to death. Mm-hmm. And within the phrase "una morte," which means death, is the word "amor," which means right. love. Right? It's totally everything <laughs> yes. fits perfectly here. Mm-hmm. And you've got all sorts of other people being punished where their desires in life that were disordered Mm -hmm. actually create the punishments that they're facing. But if, if sex stuff is kind of on the, on the grand scheme of things, not so bad, right? What are the really bad sins? The worst sin is betrayal. Hmm. So that you go from sex to gluttony to being a little too fleshy. And of course, when people think of the medieval church, all they're thinking about is trying to govern people's bodily desires, yeah. which Dante says, eh, yeah, not great, but let's move on to the stuff that matters a lot more, yeah. which is going to be uh, anytime a person in authority is leading someone astray, like the bad popes, the popes he doesn't like. Yeah, he's pretty tough on them. He's very tough on them, um, but he is absolutely toughest on those who betray, especially their benefactors, most famously Judas. Judas. So you, yes. you, you kind of, they're descending all the way down into hell. It's a little politically incorrect. You see some mosques on the way down. It's, you know, yes, you're not allowed to, uh, I don't know, he's going to get canceled if this episode goes <laughs> out and they say it's not totally politically correct. But he does have some Muslims in, per, in purgatory in heaven He does. Too. That's yes, right. He's yes. very, uh, that's just, for all the people who are going to cancel Dante, please take a moment. <laughs> there are bad and good Christians. There are bad and good Muslims. Yes. yes. Please don't cancel him. He goes down further. And then in the final, the pit of hell, there's no more fire. It's not that it's defined by fire. It's defined by a lake of ice. Right. And in that lake of ice is Satan, who is portrayed as this three-headed beast. Mm-hmm. And he's gnawing on, not he's gnawing on at the center, Judas, but other people too. Yes. We have Cassius and Brutus. These are the people who killed Julius Caesar. The people who killed Julius Caesar. Which is, aren't they heroes? Isn't that, I thought we consider those guys heroes now. Well, it's, this is a challenge about this poem because this is a, a symbol that, first of all, betrayal is never okay. Yeah. No matter who you are betraying, there are other ways to achieve it, any end you should be seeking. Um, but also, the state matters a great deal to Dante. He cares about politics because he believes that a virtuous leader and a virtuous government can create a holy society. I like this about him in particular. And it's the, it's the point that I think people hate about Dante when they right. try to approach him is, oh, it's so particular. He's, I mean, he's talking about some of his friends go to hell and all these various Florentine political figures. And they say, I don't know anything about this. I don't want to know anything about this. Right. Why, why, why can't Dante write more generally? Mm. But for Dante, the particular really matters. And for Absolutely. our own salvation, yes. the particular soul really matters. Right. And, and here is where politics matters as well. You think of today, so many Christians will say, mm. don't worry about the politics just care about the culture. Right. We shouldn't participate. But, you know, we'll hear politics is downstream of culture and that kind of, which is true in, in as far as it's true. Right. But for Dante, politics matters a lot it does. as well. Right. On the macro and the micro scale, I think that politics were so localized, of course, in his day and age that you couldn't look at some leader all the way across the country that doesn't, didn't affect your daily life. These yeah. were families that his family had known for generations. Yeah. These were people he'd grown up with. These were real human persons, which is, of course, how we should all look at politicians, as real human persons. And it, it matters for the, the state of one's character to have virtuous and correct opinions about big issues. Yeah. But what matters so much more is how you're actually treating the people that you live and work with on a day-to-day basis. And 
among these families that they all knew and they're kind of fighting with each other, but maybe they allied with each other, mm -hmm. there is this family, the Donati family, and mm -hmm. there was this marriage that was arranged when Dante was about 12, I think, right. to this woman, Gemma Donati. Mm -hmm. But one thing I notice when I, when I read the biography of Dante and his wife, the woman that he married is not the woman who inspires him to write all of his poetry. That's an the uncomfortable truth. <laughs> so what am I supposed, you've got his wife, Gemma, right? but then you've got his love, the, the absolute love of his life, right. Beatrice. Yes. That doesn't sound very kosher. It yeah, certainly, seems, it certainly a little simple, doesn't. doesn't it? What's, <laughs> well, uh, who's Beatrice? Well, what we know about her is that she was a real human woman that Dante met in person when he was nine years old and fell in love with her on the spot. And they grew up in the same neighborhood, so he would encounter her occasionally in the marketplace, occasionally around town. But they never were close, and they certainly were never lovers, as far as we know. Yeah. And Dante is in this state of deep, deep longing for her. Hmm. Her goodness and her beauty is responsible for his salvation in his mind. What that means to me is Beatrice is a real person. Yes. All, all of these people are real people. Uh, they are. To varying well, degrees are real people. Yes. But she also has a metaphorical aspect. He's certainly. not merely talking about this girl that he saw when he was nine. Right. He's certainly, he's, it's an um, incredible poetic innovation where he's able to talk about, here's this woman that I really care about and really want to have sex with. This is an erotic attachment he yeah. has to this woman. And instead of saying, well, lust is a sin, so I should turn the other way, he takes this head on and just goes through that feeling of lust towards what is here? What is it about the desire that I have for her that could teach me something about desire that would explain this most complicated of human emotions? And it is, in fact, his desire for Beatrice that teaches him how to long for and how to seek what is truly good. So it's not just, I, I like this girl, but I, should, I, I know I shouldn't like this girl, so I'm going to suppress that. Right. It's rather I should use this exactly. love that I have for this girl yes. to turn me to the highest good, who is God. So moving out of hell, mm -hmm. they get down there, they're, they're, they're uh, Virgil, his guide, and Dante yes. are climbing down, they're descending down the body of Satan, who's yes. this furry, gross creature. Which it's worth noting that it's important to distinguish Dante's Satan from, say, Milton's Satan. Okay. Milton's Satan is elegant and attractive, and yeah. you, he's, he's tempting, and you want to be with him. And it's, it's to talk about how alluring evil can sometimes be. Dante Satan is not speaking. He is, he is dumb. He's grotesque. He has three heads. He's chewing on these bloody stumps of these three traitors. Yeah. And he's flapping these bat-like wings incessantly, which actually create this icy wind that freezes this lake of ice that all of these worst sinners are locked into. So there's nothing to like about Dante Satan. Like, he's disgusting. No. And language here has even failed. There's no language that Dante yeah. can use to describe Satan because... He is so unreasonable and so yeah. backwards and so evil that it would be an indignity to language itself, to use language to describe him. So they're, they're climbing down, and then at a certain point, Virgil, the guide, says to Dante, he's always getting so afraid and he's getting so confused, <laughs> and he, he, but he realizes that they kind of turn around. Yes. So he turns toward the legs. It's not clear if he's turning toward Virgil's legs or turning toward you know, Satan's legs, whatever, but they get turned around and they, but they keep climbing. So Dante thinks they're going back up into hell. Yes. But then they're not, they come out somewhere and Dante and Virgil see, see Satan's little legs sticking out of the ground. <laughs> where are, how does that happen? All right. This is, is complicated to figure out where we are geographically, yes. but the pit of hell is purportedly made by the dirt that was displaced when Satan, when Lucifer was cast down from heaven. And so the body of Lucifer, Satan, is down, embedded right in the center of the earth. So his body and the landscape of hell are one and the same. They're melded together. And as so climbing out of hell requires climbing off of the body of Satan himself. And then all of a sudden, because the earth is round, once you pass the point where his body is, then all of a sudden you're right side up on the other side and at the foot of Mount Purgatory. How is Purgatory different than hell? Oh, in every way, because we are also suffering in purgatory, but we are suffering for a reason. People in hell are in stasis forever. They are never getting out of there. Nothing is ever going to change about their circumstance. But in purgatory, you are in an arduous climb to go up. The terraces of the mountain correspond to sins of which one might be guilty. But you can work off your guilt while you're there, and you can ascend and get closer and closer. And the souls who are there know why they're there, and they know where they're going. Hmm. So this, there's a lot of suffering in Mount Purgatory still, but it resounds with hope. 
and with light and with communities of people. The isolation of hell is replaced by the chorus of purgatory, where the group is all working together. Because when Dante enters hell for the first time with Virgil, mm -hmm. there's a big sign over hell, and it's very beautiful. We won't go through the whole thing, but the last line is very famous, and it's, yes. abandon all hope, ye who enter. Yes. There's no <laughs> hope there at all. But you get yes. to purgatory, and there's a lot of burning, and a lot of fire, and a lot of punishment. Right. But there's hope. There's absolutely hope. So how does Dante ascend through purgatory? Because if there's hope, that means purgatory is not the end. Right. You first get to a, a group full of people who have salvation kind of by a de facto matter. Maybe they were baptized or had a praying mom or a last minute prayer, yeah. uh, but they don't understand why they're there. And so you, he mills around with them for a while until all of a sudden he sees one person who's willing to start this arduous climb. He's leaving this valley where everyone's lingering, waiting to climb. And it's this soul who finally, after being there for however many years, turns at the sun and says, I care for only this. And he is letting go of all of his earthly concerns, even worried about politics, worried about his own reputation, all the things that are keeping people down on the surface of the earth. Yeah. When he lets it go and looks at the light, then he's ready to start climbing because he's focused on something outside of himself, above himself, better than himself. And that is what lures him upward to start climbing toward God. So we've got this image of purgatory as a mountain. Yes. And you're, you, you've got to climb up it. Mm -hmm. You're climbing all the way up and they finally get in. And so where's the fire? I've been told there will be fire. I've been told there will be punishment. <laughs> the fire is in the very last level, the very last terrace, uh, which is the terrace of lust. And that is the one punishment in, uh, he's, as he climbs, he observes the punishments that others are suffering. Yeah. But Dante himself has to pass through this flame of lust before he can leave Mount Purgatory, which leads us to believe he might have felt some guilt in that area. Well, I noticed, because this is a recurring theme, you know, mm -hmm. in, that, in the canto we talked about in Hell, with right. Paolo and Francesca and the lust. Mm -hmm. The, the way Francesca describes how she and her lover started to get a little fresh right. was they were sitting there reading a book. Yes. They were reading this book about... Lancelot. An, an affair about mm -hmm. Lancelot. Right. Mm -hmm. And Dante seems particularly struck by this. And prior to writing the Divine Comedy, Dante wrote a lot of love poetry, yeah. um, a lot of which was pretty fresh. Yeah. to use your word. Yeah. Um, a little frisky, so, <laughs> a little saucy. Yes, perhaps. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he might feel concerned, perhaps, that some of his prior writing might have led some of his readers astray or put some, some kind of impure thought in their mind. But he's also determined to make good on what he means by lust. What is there to explore that is beyond the lustful feeling in this deep erotic love you can have for another person? So we are burning off the sin of lust, but all that does is give him the freedom to experience this erotic love and longing that he has for Beatrice in a pure way. So you're not getting rid of the erotic love. No, way. you're redeeming it. You're, you're cleansing redeeming. it, purifying right. it. Speaking of cleansing and purifying, we mm -hmm. get to the top of purgatory. Yes. And then we end up, before we get into heaven itself, we end up in the Garden of Eden. Right. Right. We end up in the, the earthly paradise where our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, were before they ate that damned apple and yeah. <laughs> gave us this world that we're all living in now. Yes. What does the Garden of Eden tell us? How does that lead us up to heaven? It tells us that there was a plan for a fantastic world, that there was a place designed for humans, created by God, that is perfect. It is verdant and it's cool, it's beautiful, there's plant life, it's everything on earth working perfectly. And this harmonious coexistence among all the people who live there, which are, it's, and Dante takes this opportunity to describe how the narrative of the gospel itself, how the scripture is just pouring forth out of this place. It's coming out like a fountain overflowing as the landscape and these representations of people who live there want to explain the beauty of the God who created this beautiful place. And it's important that Dante takes a minute to do that while we're still on the surface of the earth, because we haven't left earth yet, because we're yeah. on Mount Purgatory, that this is not about leaving earth to get to heaven because earth is so bad, you yeah. know, and it's not a sort of, there's a temptation to read it in a bit of a platonic lens where you want to, there's the the heavy, the physical is weighing down the spirit. Like f physical bad, spiritual spirit good. good. Right. Yeah. And I, I completely oppose that reading of Dante yeah. because he wants to say that physical is so good. It's yeah. ultimately good. And especially if all of this is designed by a God who has a physical body through the incarnate Christ, then the physical has to actually be great and perfect. Right. And so Dante takes this opportunity in the Garden of Eden to show us this physical, worldly, earthly perfection that we were meant to enjoy and should work to restore. And so he's there, he's in the garden, and there's a nice little stream. 
that's yes. coming through, nice lots of water. So he drinks this water, and the water erases his memory of sin. Right. And it reminds him, in, a, in another way, right. of all the good works. Right. That he could that he could remember. So it's it's cleansing in right. a very literal way. It's cleansing his mind. Right. Right. And he's not the inventor of the passing through a river that makes you forget your sins. That's not original to Dante. What is, is the second river, it's called the Eunoe, that yeah. reminds you of all of the good things about your life. So the first one is Leth, and yes. that get rid, gets rid of your sins. But the right. Eunoe yeah. sounds like the beginning of The Lion King. Eunoe, yes. Eunoe. Uh, that's the one that reminds you of all the good things. Right, exactly. Yeah. And then he encounters Beatrice herself. Beatrice. Yes. He's the, still my beating heart. The one that his, the hope of seeing Beatrice someday is what has gotten him through the arduous journey of Inferno in these first few steps through. And, and purgatory. purgatory to yes, right. Yeah, right. Yes. He says, I don't want to go on. I don't want to keep doing this. And as Virgil is guiding him, he says, I can almost see her face yeah. on the other side. <laughs> She's there, buddy. Keep going. these flames. Yeah. I know they're burning, but there's, there's something you're really going to be excited about on the other side. And then he sees her. Yes. And... She's a huge jerk to him. She is. She's not. You're waiting the whole time. You're like, oh, this is going to be the, they're going to kiss, you know, they're going to embrace. Right. No, <laughs> no way. Not. She's yes. a huge jerk to him. Yes. Why the, is that? Dante describes her as a stern admiral. <laughs> yes. She has this sort of military power. It's because her goodness and virtue, which was true on earth, but now in her beatified state, we should note she's, she died at this point. She died when she was very young yes. before he started writing. So she's been in heaven for a while. Yeah. Dante beholding Beatrice in her beatified state, she is immensely intimidating to him and yeah. terrifying. And she has a lot to rebuke him for. Yeah. <laughs> and so he, as he imagines being this kind of gallant lover, you know, we've talked about Lance a lot. That's how Dante wants to be greeting his Beatrice. But he casts his eyes down like a little boy who's been yelled at by his mom. You see, beginning around here and, and going all the way up through heaven, this image of Dante like a little boy yes. coming back. Why? Why is that? Why has why is this grown man become a little boy? I have to think that it has to do with the scripture, you know, be like these little children to come mm. unto me. That there's something about the humility of getting rid of all of your power, your authority, your education, your learning, casting all of your virtues aside to humbly approach the good, to approach God, is kind of the only way. I think we're probably all destined for that, a return to childhood as we seek to improve ourselves. So we're almost <laughs> at this perfect image where yes. Dante is going to behold the face of God. Yes. But there's one last really sad moment here. And it's this probably the saddest moment of the whole poem. I cry every time. Virgil, Dante's beloved guide, has to leave him. He does. Why does he have to leave? He's not a Christian. He does not have salvation, so he cannot advance to the realm of the saved. Because Virgil's a, he was a pagan. He was poet. a pagan, yes. And he lives in, you know, the beginning of Inferno. We actually get to see where Virgil lives. And it's with all of the other virtuous pagans, the heroes from antiquity, some fictional, some historical, you know, who have a, an okay life. It's a little dreary, but there's yeah. a castle and a nice field and they all get to hang out together. And when Dante walks through there, he's very tempted to actually just stay there forever yeah, because all of the people he likes reading the most, all of his intellectual heroes are all assembled in one place. And yeah, I'd love to sit down and chat but, with Aristotle and Homer. But the problem there is it might be pleasant enough, right? but there's no hope. Exactly. And Dante turns to talk to Virgil, mm -hmm. but he's gone. And right. so he starts crying. And, right. and Beatrice, as her character would suggest, yes. she doesn't you know, come over and hug him. She says, hey, Dante, stop crying. Yeah. <laughs> stop crying. She says it to him twice. Yes, the work has only just begun for him. Yeah. He thinks he's been through so much, which he has, but there is a lot left to go. You know, and we really do need to convey the importance of Virgil as a mentor and a leader. You yeah. know, he's brought him through hell. He's brought him through purgatory, which purgatory is something that Virgil really knows nothing about because he doesn't have salvation. He didn't yeah. know anything about purgatory when he was alive, but he's there as a loving companion and encourager of Dante the entire way. And there's a, a beautiful scene, another place where I always cry, where as he, that they're on the shore of Mount Purgatory, Virgil looks over at Dante, and Dante's face is covered in the soot and the grime of hell, and his face is all blackened. And so Virgil rubs his fingers on the grass, and the dew from the grass he uses to gently wipe his face clean so he can be presentable for his climb to Purgatory. You know, and Virgil, having no understanding of what that means, it's incredibly tender. There's times where Virgil picks him up like a baby and carries him across dangerous thresholds. It's This man has really been there for Dante, but he can't go on. He cannot go past the Garden of Eden. It's very sweet, but I've got to be the Beatrice here. Yeah. <laughs> Virgil's gone. He's, He's gone. passed. we got to go up to heaven. <laughs> yes. So he goes up. They go up to heaven. Right. And she is leading him now on this way. Mm -hmm. And before he gets to see the face of God, 
he encounters some ancestors of his. He does. Two ancestors in particular. Yes. Who are they? Well, the one I like best is Cachaguida, who is his great-grandfather, who was a crusader. And the fact that this grandfather of Dante's fought in the Crusades had afforded his own family some degree of nobility in Dante's lifetime. So I'm sure there are many of us who have an ancestor in our lineage who's inspired us. Maybe we bear, carry their names. Maybe we have a portrait of them on the wall. It's about family legacy and this character who Dante never met but had heard so much about in his lifetime had given so much dignity and sense of self to Dante during his life. And so he's standing there in the, the heaven of Mars. Each of the levels of heaven are, are named after the planets and the, the sort of mythological attachments that they have. He's standing there and then sees like a shooting star that goes streaking across the sky, this light that then comes right to him and greets him, oh my blood. He's so proud that Dante has come to heaven to see him. And there, the conversation that ensues about them is, is deeply touching because Dante admires this Cacciaguida so much for his, his valiant warfare as sort of a knight of his day. But then Cacciaguida turns and says, well, do you know what the true warfare is? Poetry. <laughs> there is a real battle to be fought, and it's, it's not against any foreign enemy. It is against the darkness and the evil that is in, embedded in daily life, and those who are willing to combat it with all of the resources they have, which in Dante's case is his talent as a poet. Is, uh, he moves forth from this, this encounter with his great-grandfather, feeling emboldened to be the author of truth and to convey everything that he's seen because his grandfather has given him that charge. He's got that charge mm -hmm. to, to, to write this poem, to mm -hmm. write the poem that we're talking about. Yes. Before he does that, though, he's got to meet another ancestor of his, actually the first ancestor of his, mm. who's Adam himself. The first ancestor, yes, and, indeed. And Adam... You know, we think of him as kind of a dunce because he ate the apple. <laughs> right. Adam has a lot of wisdom to convey. He certainly does, yes. He's a magnificent character in Dante. And Dante has this one burning question that he can't wait to ask him. And we all know that Dante, as a poet, really loves language and finds it very valuable. Yeah. So he goes up to Adam and says, you have to tell me, what was the language that you spoke in the Garden of Eden? The language he used to discourse with Eve, that he used to name the animals, that he used to speak to God. And Adam says, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> it's language. He says, I'm sure before my generation was dead, they were speaking a brand new one. Language is always fluid and always changing. And Dante is a little bit crestfallen, but he's starting to understand that the, the language that we use is, you know, maybe not the, the perfect tool to convey the truth that he wants to communicate, which is about right before that, or right after that encounter with Adam is right as he's getting seriously starting to approach God himself. And Dante then starts to get really nervous about how he's going to describe that because all he has is his version of some human language yeah. that is, is not eternal. And it's worth noting too, Dante writes this poem, very, very uncommon, revolutionary at the time. Right. He writes it in the vernacular. He writes it in Italian. Yes. Actually, our, much of our Italian language comes from Dante. Indeed, yes. Instead of Latin, which yes. is what everybody was writing in. Yes. And, and while he's talking to Adam, he actually kind of has Adam disagree with some of what Dante used to say yeah. about <laughs> language you know right. and you see this ev evolution of dante where dante in the past had written and said that adam spoke hebrew in the garden right and now adam says now he and i spoke whatever who cares it's already lost right the same thing with dante's political evolution dante mm -hmm. was a partisan he had a political party he was Certainly. a he was a white guelph was mm -hmm. the name of the political party he was in but later on as actually cachaguida says to him mm -hmm. it, it's better to become a political party unto yourself Right. He moves beyond partisan politics. Right. He even moves beyond the, the need for this one language right. that Adam spoke in the garden. Right, because that they, at this point in the poem, we're getting a very strong sense that there's one thing that matters, and that is God himself, and moving always in that direction. You know, regardless of what language you're speaking, or city you're born in, or party you belong to, that there is a right thing to believe and a right thing to do, and it is entirely directed towards the divine himself. So in our remaining moments, mm -hmm. would you please, if you will, um, summarize uh, Dante's vision of God. If you could possibly just, I know that language will uh, utterly fail to, uh, to comprehend the ineffable uh, image of God, but if you wouldn't mind, what's well, he say? It's worth noting also that Paradiso is just as long as the previous two. He's not skipping through Paradiso quickly. He's yeah. had just as many conversations. So this feels like a big, there's a, a long crescendo that is leading yeah. to this moment. And Dante He's really nervous about it. So he prays that he would find the words to articulate what he's about to behold, but he knows it's not going to work. 
And he's passed off from Beatrice, who's been his guide through heaven, off to St. Bernard, who had a particular devotion to the Virgin Mary during his lifetime. So then he kind of goes to Mary, and then all of a sudden... And the, Mar and the Mary cantos are oh, magnificent. magnificent. I mean, these are, yes. you know, you're, you're already, you think, you're reading uh, Dante's description of Mary and you're thinking, oh my God, how could I possibly, you know, you're on the verge of, really, you're on the verge Absolutely. of tears as you're reading that. Right. And then you get to God himself. Right. And so he sees, he describes this, these three circles that are also one circle, but they bear different colors. And so there's distinction between the three, but unity between the three, because he's trying to describe what the Trinity looks like. But it's very active, and it's all moving, and it's just radiating light. And he sits there, and as he beholds the Godhead, he wonders, wow, I'm, I'm just like a geometer trying to square the circle, which is, in, in his day, kind of an impossible math problem. He's sitting there like a, a logician who's trying to logically understand what's happening. And he's showed us what he does know about how circles and squares and geometry works throughout the previous lines of the poem. But now his skill in geometry isn't going to help him because all he can do is stand there and behold and be beheld. And there are Dante scholars who, who say that this final moment of beholding the beatific vision is kind of an anticlimax because... There's no Jesus. He doesn't sit there and have a conversation with Jesus and have Jesus he say sees like... Him. He sees the face. He, do, he does. He's, he's the one of the circles of the Trinity bears the, the, the effigy, he called the image of the human. And so how do you do that? I mean, how could you, you know, this is something he struggles with. Right. How, uh, he said, I can't even describe how right. the, it, the human nature is within this divine nature, yes. but it, it's there. Right. But yeah, they don't have, they don't sit and have a cup of coffee. Right. Yes. He's trying to explain how a physical being is somehow one with an entirely non-physical being, but that difference between physical and non-physical falls apart. That distinction doesn't have any meaning here. Yeah. But so Dante's trying to sit there and puzzle over how to describe this and to share it with his readers. All he can really say is that I was transformed is the will and the vele, which is a kind of a Latin theological term that also means will. So he has these two modes of willing that are both uniquely transformed and are in this sudden harmony with this immense source of love that is so powerful that the love itself is what is giving motion to the entire universe. The Italian is, l'amor che muove il sole l'altre stelle. Yes. The love that moves the sun and the other stars. And that's the last thing you're left with. I finished reading this mm -hmm. a couple hours before <laughs> I got here. And I, I, kid, I sat at my desk and cried <laughs> at the end of it. I'm gonna, they're going right. to make fun of me in the YouTube comments for this. <laughs> but I did. I cried. You, it, it's, you can't help yourself. Right. I know. Well, if anyone makes fun of you, ask them what makes them cry. That's and right. A, yeah. <laughs> at least for me, it's the love that moves the sun and the other exactly, stars. Exactly. Yes. A love so powerful that it's it's truly, it is the engine behind the planets moving around each other between the water being gathered to one place, the land existing, the intense love that Dante feels for Beatrice, the remorse over his sins, the this whole world, the way the, the plants grow, the way the mountains rise, all of these things are ordered by this love that emanates from this singular source that, that takes into account Dante's life and his person, where he's going, what he deeply wants. And to be one with that source in this final moment is, I don't know who's not going to cry at that. <laughs> All right. At that, we have to go off camera so they don't see me cry on camera. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much for thank being you for here. I think, I think we covered the whole thing, didn't we? Yeah. I yeah. We got all of it, I'm we sure. We got yeah. all of it. Maybe we'll have to have you back for hundreds of more hours I hope to so. go through all of this. And I hope in the meantime, everyone else enjoys reading it and follows that pilgrim's journey all the way through and all the way up to the love that moves the sun and the other stars. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Book Club. See you next time. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Book Club on PragerU. PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so we rely on donations from viewers like you to keep this content on the air. Please consider making a tax-deductible contribution today to help keep this content coming. Thank you very much.